when you do DMT, you're like, Whoa. reality dissolves and you're there. Like the last one that I had was very strange. Like there was these jesters that were giving me the finger. They kept giving me the finger. I'm like, what is this about? And there's this weird fractal thing that's constantly going on. But every time I do it, it seems like these lessons that are wrapped up in these visions with communicating entities, whatever the fuck they are, whether they're figments of your imagination or whether they're real, there's always lessons in there. They look like jokers. They have like joker masks on. And they you see them when your eyes are open or your yeah. eyes are closed? Your eyes are closed. You see oh. them way more visual. The visuals are way more potent than anything you could ever see with your eyes open. They give you the finger. They, they're spinning around giving you the finger. Oh, and they spiteful change. little bastards. Well, they're having fun with you. They're letting you know. Like, stop. I think it's their way of telling you not to take yourself seriously. What do like, you think? Look where we are. Like, you take yourself seriously? Dude, we're, we're in another dimension, and we're fucking mocking you. But you're creating <laughs> it, right? Your brain's creating it. I don't know. It. Yeah, I would, th I would think so. You think there's really something out there? <sighs> What here's I don't know like someone say like maybe it's all in your head when you trip Maybe it's not really happening. Okay, maybe however the experience is exactly the same if you really are going into another dimension You really are experiencing love in its purest form and forgiveness and uh, just 100% wisdom like all the bullshit and all the flaws of your thinking and all of the ridiculous aspects of the world around you revealed in some wonderful dance by jesters who are giving you the finger in a never-ending complex geometric pattern even if it's not real it's still the same experience sure. like if you really do go to that dimension and you really do experience these in incredibly enlightened beings and they really do instill upon you wisdom and you really do hold on to a few grains of that that sand that slips through your finger you hold on to a little bit of it mm. while you're there you got handfuls but you just hold on to a little bit it's still the same experience yeah, that yeah. shit's real son it's really easy to dismiss and say it's all in your imagination but for someone who has experienced it it's very difficult to accept and it's very difficult for you to n say that you know for sure that it's all your imagination if you haven't experienced it I, d I it's very I, I appreciate from a from a um, uh, an intelligence standpoint someone's perspective on it that hasn't experienced it but the reality is until you know what you're talking until you've actually gone into that thing and know how titanically alien it is you you're really just saying things you're just making noises with your mouth you don't you, you, it's no way there's no way you could know it's you're not there anymore you go to a different place you experience a different reality more real than what we normally interpret as reality that's the most fucked up yeah. part about it is it's so much crisper and more vibrant and brighter and then reality itself seems muted in some odd way these gestures were all going fuck you I was like why are they going fuck you and I was trying to figure out what it is it's like it's almost uh, an, an inoculation to hostility like they're like letting you like what why are you even taking this in like, you know, what it, why, why are you even concentrating on that? This is pointless. There's so much more. That's what they tell you when you do DMT. That's what those things are doing when they're giving you the finger. They're like, ah, you fucking idiot. You take yourself seriously. One of my trips, one of the most profound ones, um, it was like these like almost like children that were in this, this dimension. Children that were like infinitely more intelligent than me, but behaved like children and communicated like children. And they would say, I love you 600 million 500,000 times like something like a kid would say like I love you infinity I love you 50 million south 700,000 fifth like you know like that yeah. kind of shit they would say that and then they would go look at this and they kept saying look at this and every time they would say look at this they would show you something that was so impossibly beautiful like tears were like flowing down my face because I was conscious I was I had my eyes closed and I was seeing this and I was conscious but I was crying because it was so beautiful and then they would say it again I love you 600 million 500,000 times look at this and then they would show you something even more insane like a million times more insane what than they what you showing just saw. You? What were they didn't didn't make any sense it was just you can't describe it it's just the, the fractal nature of the universe embodied in imagery which also had meaning and love connected to it so when you're seeing it you weren't just seeing something beautiful but you were feeling it and it was like almost like it was running through wow. your soul like it was cleansing you as you saw it like everything that i saw made me 
every time I saw it, every new thing made me love people more, made me love life more, made me more appreciative, made me want to hug more. And then I thought that was over, and they would go, look at this. And then you'd get hit with a new wave. And it was just overwhelming. I'm just crying. Like, I couldn't, couldn't wow. hold it in. It was wow. just so unbelievably intense. Fuck, man, I've had trips that stuck with me for five or six years, where every day I would think about that trip for five or six years. Tryptamine hallucinogens. These are short-acting, very powerful psychedelic drugs. And the reason we were so interested in these drugs is because in encounters with it in the pure chemical form, it was in very, the intoxication was invariably characterized by encounters with elves, gnomes, fairies, thousands of these things and this was uh, and this is something I'm going to um, you know try and convince the UFO community of what we drug people have that you don't is repeatability and the scientists always said to you UFO people what you don't have is repeatability they don't want to even talk to us but it is true that, that when you smoke DMT, for example, at a sufficiently high and prepared dose, you get elves. Everybody does. Uh, you may not believe it, but on the other hand, it only takes five minutes to prove that I'm bullshitting you 100%. You want contact? You want elves? You want alien intelligence? You'll have it up the kazoo. <laughs> you are instantly plunged into an environment of elf intelligence. Self-transforming machine elves, I call these things, or types. It's not clear they are made of matter. They are made of light. Their status on the phylogeny of biology is extraordinarily murky. Uh, and they come pounding forward like badly trained dogs cheering. They say, here you are. You may all recall, some of you may recall that old Pink Floyd song, the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. So there you are. Now, 20 seconds before, you were in an apartment somewhere with your scuzzy friends doing drugs. <laughs> now that's gone. And you are in this place being confronted by these entities. And one of the things they do that's quite disconcerting is they come jumping up or dribbling up to you, and then they will sort of vibrate in place, then they jump into your chest, then they jump back out. But the main thing is they are doing something very, very interesting. What they're doing is they... I call, the reason I call them language elves is because they possess an ontos of language that is completely alien to us. They use a language which you can see. They can condense meaning before your very eyes. For them, syntax is not acoustical rules. It's pictorial rules. And they are doing this. They will scramble forward, elbowing each other, jumping up and down, very excited. And they say, look at this. Look at this. And they pull objects, sing objects into existence and show them to you. And as your attention goes into these things, you, you are... It's, the emotion is indescribable. These objects are made of gold, ivory, smaragdine, chalcedony, beryllium, terbium, flesh, gold, blood, heat, tears, and it's all changing, morphing as you look at it. And as you look at this, you have without an iota of doubt the conviction, if I could bring this thing across, it would end human history. Argument would cease. You would just say, Look, look at this. 
And they're pushing each other away, showing you, look at this one, look at this one. These objects themselves emit sound and make other objects. It's impossible to make these things. The nearest analogy would be to the Fabergé eggs or something like that. But these things are like the toys that are scattered around the nursery inside a UFO or something. Celestial toys. And they are the toys themselves appear to be somehow alive. The toys themselves can uh, sing other objects into existence. So what's happening is there's just this proliferation of elf gifts and the elf gifts are moving around, singing, and the whole thing is directed toward, they're saying, do what we are doing. And the entities say, they say, don't give way to amazement. Don't flip out about how you can't believe it and it's impossible and so forth and so on. Don't do that. Just pay attention. Pay attention to what we are doing and what we are showing you. And what they preach is a new dispensation of language, a language that can be beheld. The demons are of many kinds. Some are made of ions, some of mind. The ones of ketamine, you'll find, stutter often and are blind. All right. And of all the others, I might say as well, it is not that you kneel in genuflection before a god because you will be like Dorothy before Oz. There is no dignity in the universe unless you meet these things uh, on your feet. And that means that you have an I-thou relationship and you say, okay, well, you say you're omniscient, omnipresent, or you say you're from Zeta Reticuli, or you say, you say you're long on talk, but what can you show me? And uh, magicians, people who invoke these things, have always understood that you go into it with your wits about you. And you find yourself in a space. Uh, it has a feeling of being underground or somehow insulated and domed. It's what in Finnegan's Wake is called the merry-go-round from the German word Raum for space. And you actually, the room is going around. And in that space, you feel like a child. You feel that you have come out somewhere in eternity. And it always reminds me of the 53rd uh, fragment of Heraclitus, which is the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. And you not only become the aeon at play with colored balls, but there are entities which are self-transforming machine elves. But, and this is sort of what they are. They're um, dynamically contorting topological modules that are somehow distinct from the surrounding background, which is itself undergoing this continuous transformation. They all, I always think of the scene in uh, The Wizard of Oz after the house knocks the witch down and she's in munchkin land and the head of the munchkins comes with a scroll and they all have very squeaky voices and they sing a little song about <laughs> you are absolutely and completely dead <laughs> and they're marching around her. <laughs> so the munchkins come, these hyperdimensional machine elf entities and they bathe you in love it's a kind of um, well it's not erotic and it's not heartful but it sure feels good <laughs> <laughs> and what they are saying is don't be alarmed remember and do what we are doing what is necessary to have validity in these experiences is uh, the terror the terror is the stamp of validity on the experience because it means, you know, this is real. We are in the balance and uh, in these states with these tryptamine drugs, we read the literature, we know what the maximum doses are, the LD50, this and that. But so great is one's faith in mind 
that when you are out there, you know that the rules of pharmacology do not really apply and that control of existence on the plane is a matter of decision and luck and the role of the dice. Uh, so they are reassuring you, these little entities, and saying, don't worry, don't worry, do this, look at this. Meanwhile, uh, you are completely there. Your fear reflexes are intact. You are not fuzzed out at all. You know, and it persists and it persists and you breathe and it persists and they're saying, you know, don't don't get some loop of wonder going that quenches your ability to understand. Just try not to be so amazed. Try to hang in and look at what we're doing. And what they're doing is um, emitting sounds like music, like language. And these sounds uh, pass, as Philo Judeus said that the Logos would when it became perfect, pass from being heard without ever going over a quantized uh, moment of distinction into things beheld. And so what you, you hear and behold a language of alien meaning which is taking place right in front of you and it is conveying alien uh, information which cannot be Englished. Now being a monkey there is a, there is a, a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance that is set up in your hind brain when you encounter an unenglishable object because you try to pour mind over it and it just sheds it like water off a duck's back. And then you try again and you are looking at it and this cognitive dissonance, this wow or flutter that is building off this object uh, causes wonder or awe, awe at the brink of terror. So you have to keep controlling that. And the way to control it is to do what they're telling you to do, which is do what we are doing. I had one trip where metaphorically not having hands, they all turned and waved and said, deja vu, deja vu. Let us go back to our Egyptian religion, where we learn that Ta, P-T-A-H, the potter of Memphis, the deity who fashioned the world upon a potter's wheel in the form of the egg of Seb, the great mother goose, by the way, a little tie up to our fairy story and our fairy stories and our mother goose legends. Because in several religions, the world was the was created in the form of the egg of a mother goose. Rather curious. But folklore has stepped in and distorted these things almost beyond resemblance to the facts. But Ta, who fashioned the world egg, Similar to the world egg of the Greeks, which broke into the golden and silver hemispheres and gave birth to Catherine Pollux. But this egg, fashioned on the potter's wheel, uh, was the work of the master builder, the master potter. And Ta was the lord, governor, and presiding genius over the seven Harmonian artifices. And these Harmonian artifices in Egypt were dwarfs mysterious little beings represented glyphically as gnome-like figures, each of which held in its hand a bare knife, held in this kind of a position, upright knife. These were the knives with which the worlds were gouged out of space. And the uh, seven Harmonian artifices are said to have come out of the earth near the site of the Great Pyramid. They were the ancient ones, the formators, the fashioners of things. And there were therefore, among the Egyptians, beliefs about the seven creating powers or laws. In the ancient Kabbalah, the creating fiat or word was spoken in the form of the seven vowels, two of which again were mystery vowels or secret letters, which could not be known and for the deficiency of which the great name could not be restored, captured, or preserved. In the Jewish early works in Genesis, we find in the opening chapters the Elohim. And the Elohim are the seven creating powers 
of the great deity who is said to have fashioned the world in the opening chapters of Genesis. These are the spirits of God that moved upon the face of the deep. Their number was identical with that of the Armonian artificers of Egypt. They were the powers or creating attributes released by the speaking of the word of creation. And this word was always a word composed of vowels. So we go back to the mystery of the five dash seven vowels. All these points to all these things point to some kind of a doctrine, which frankly and obviously is very difficult to trace after so long a time, but it meant something and had a very clear and definite bearing upon the entire structure of the universal organization as it was known to the ancients. I have been discussing the role of a certain person called the Joker. The Joker being the one who has insight into the fact that all our social institutions are games. The social game is played with an initial rule. The first rule being this game is serious or this game is not a game. And therefore there is a tendency within society to resist very strongly any notion that what it is doing is not altogether serious. And at a still deeper level, beneath the level of social institutions, there is also the recognition on the part of the joker that the basic forms of nature are also games. The human game, the rabbit game, the mouse game, the bee game, the tree game, the stone game. Because all these are forms of a musical nature, that is to say, they are forms played for themselves. They are played in the most intimate interconnection and interrelationship with each other. But they don't have any purpose beyond what is happening in the same way as music and dancing. But when people take games seriously, and part of the fun of the game, you must remember, is to take it seriously, they acquire an attitude which strikes the joker as being half funny and sometimes a little pitiful. A, a good joker is inclined, really, not to laugh at people because uh, if a person is terribly seriously involved in the sense of the kind of person we call colloquially a square, the joker feels sorry for them because they live a deprived life. To play the game uh, and to know it's a game can be uh, quite fascinating and not uh, really giving the show away but giving it away enough somehow and that you see is the, the joker's function so what he is doing then is he is in a point of view where he sees all that is going on as a game. He doesn't take anything seriously. When I bring up the Joker, of course, we're in a way discussing it in terms of the game of cards, because the Joker is the card beyond roll, the card that's wild, that can be any card in the pack. In other words, it's delivered from being a particular someone and can be in an anyone. And it pops up here, and it pops up there, and it pops up here. And you never know where is the joker, who is the joker. You see, the thing that, uh, that we have to understand, really, is that all the roles are the joker playing them. 
and the Joker is looking at you out of all pairs of eyes. There he is. Only he's pretending very often that he's not the Joker at all. Oh no, this is just me. I'm not the Joker. Where is the Joker? That's what they tell you when you do DMT. That's what those things are doing when they're giving you the finger. They're like, ah, you fucking idiot. You take yourself seriously. 